morning, everyone. I just want to say I really appreciated uh, your words this morning, Corey. Thank you for your ministry. Um, we've got different missionaries that do a lot of different things, but as, as someone who was in the service myself, a young guy and uh, off on my own and confronted by the things of the world, it would have been just having a ministry like that available where I was would have made a tremendous difference in my life and the lives of the guys around me. So that you guys are offering that uh, for, for these people is it's tremendous. I really, really appreciate that. All right. So last week we wrapped up our study of Nahum. Is it Nahum? No, Philemon. We did that after Nahum. And we're going to start Daniel, but again, we've got so many people out right now. I said, we're going to hold off on that a little bit, and we're going to spend a few weeks looking at prayer. And it's a series that I've been wanting to do for a long time. One, prayer is really important, so it's a good thing to talk about. And two, I think it's something that all of us could probably improve on at least a little bit in one fashion or another. And so I originally thought, well, I'm going to work through this and do it like a six-part series, and we'll do who, then what, then when, then where, then why, and then how. You really break it down like that. And I kind of like that, but then the problem is when I started putting that together, so much of this stuff overlaps, like the who and the how, and it, it just overlapped enough where it just wasn't working out like that. So instead, I thought, well, we'll just maybe start out with the basics and then we'll get deeper and deeper and deeper. So we're going to walk and then we're going to start to run and then we're going to sprint. So today we're going to walk, we're going to cover some basics, we're going to start with the Lord's Prayer and I think that's a great place to start. We did cover this at a high level about a year and a half ago when we were working through the harmonized uh, view of the Gospels. And we're going to, so there'll be a little bit of review today if you were here for that, but we're going to dive into a lot more depth in all of these things today. And then we'll wrap up kind of looking at what we're going to look at going forward and uh, there'll be some challenges for us. So if you want to go ahead and start turning there, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, starting in about verse 5, but before this prayer even gets recorded in the Bible. We have some other things going on. We can kind of pick up the discussion right about Matthew chapter 4. And there, Jesus calls his disciples, and he begins performing some miracles. And yes, he's already turned water into wine or what have you, but now he starts healing people. And remember, we said that the purpose of miracles in the Bible is always, always to authenticate the messenger. So it makes sense. Jesus is starting off his ministry. He's doing these things to show everyone that he has the power of God. Therefore, they should listen to what he has to say. But as we saw when we were working through the Gospels previously, Jesus is performing these miracles. He's authenticating who he is. Then that spectacle of the authentication tended to attract some crowds. People loved to follow him around just to see him heal people. And they, they got the teachings, but uh, the spectacle was a big part of why people were interested and, uh, and, and following him around. And so he's healing people. He's got people following him around. And then in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus walks up onto the mountainside and the crowds and the disciples follow him, and he starts to teach. And we have this section of teaching in Matthew that runs from chapter 5 through chapter 7, and it's what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And we call it that because it's a sermon, and he's on a mountain, side of a mountain when he does it, so not that hard. But it's a wonderful portion of scripture here, and there's a whole lot of depth in this sermon. He starts out with the Beatitudes. And then Jesus teaches about salt and light. And Jesus gives this just tremendous statement that he has come to fulfill the law, not to abolish it. I mean, this is tremendous stuff that he's talking about here. Then he tells us that you don't have to overtly commit murder or adultery to commit murder or adultery. You can do those things in your heart. Just incredibly challenging things. He lays out the parameters for divorce he warns against taking oaths. He teaches them to turn the other cheek. We talked a lot about that last week, didn't we? And he says that we need to love our enemies, give to the needy. And then Jesus talks about prayer. 
And he gives us this incredible template with the Lord's Prayer on how we should be praying. But before he starts telling us how we should pray, he first starts out with some warnings about how not to pray. So again, we're in Matthew chapter 6, so we're going to start out here with verses 5 through 8. He says, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. So again, Jesus is about to teach, his, teach these people, and by extension us, how they, how we should be praying. And he starts out with a few warnings on, here's, here's what not to do. And he starts out with a warning in verse 5 saying, don't be a hypocrite. Because apparently, and we know there's nothing new under the sun, it was somewhat common at that time for people to put on a show for others while they were praying. And so Jesus is pointing out, this is, this is a hypocritical thing to do, right? Because when you're praying, it's supposed to be a communication between you and God. That's the purpose of prayer. But the people who were doing this thing, sort of standing on the street, putting on a show for everyone to see, they were acting as if they were having a communication with God. But what they were really doing was communicating to the people around them, look how spiritual I am. And Jesus says, don't do that. He says, when you do that, when you put on a show for others with your prayers to show, oh, here, what a great prayer person this is. He says, you'll get rewarded for that, but your reward is just the admiration of the people around you. The, the people that you have impressed so much with just how spiritual you are, that, that's your reward, right? So that's the reward for this kind of folly, but there's an implication in what Jesus has said because he's implying, well, when you do it wrong, you get this other reward, the implication here is that if you do it right, there's going to be a reward that is worth much, much more. And so in verse 6, he gives us the next part of that. He says, instead of praying in this hypocritical fashion in front of everybody and putting on a show, he says, go do this, go into your room, pray in private. Make your prayer just between you and God. And then the result is, he's saying the result is that reward, that benefit that you would have missed out in praying incorrectly in verse 5, then you're going to receive this reward from God instead. And they're going to be tremendous. And we're going to talk a lot more about these rewards in part two next week or, or maybe the week after. But also we got to understand here, this is Jesus saying, when you pray, don't do this on the street corner, go into your room and do this privately. This is not a prohibition against public prayer. Jesus isn't saying you can't pray publicly. We got to look at the context here. This is just simply a warning against praying hypocritically. We're going to talk more about public prayer another Sunday, but uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Jesus is not speaking out against that. In verse 7, he gave us another warning. He gave us a warning about this just constant babbling and continuing on and on and on when you're praying. Right? And the the point of that, he's saying, you just keep yakking on. The, the pagans thought if they just uttered a bunch of stuff, then maybe the gods would hear them. With a, a tremendous volume of words, then that must convince whatever god to, to listen to whatever they were saying. And Jesus is telling them, you, you don't have to pray that way as a Christian. And I can honestly say, I don't think I've heard anybody in all the years we've been here, I don't think I've heard any of you doing this. But um, when Sierra and I first got married, we were... We started going to another church for a while, and this was like a thing. It would get to be prayer time, and it wasn't so much a time when we would gather together and pray to God. It felt more like a competition where we would get together and see who could pray the longest. And if you didn't pray for at least 10 minutes, man, there was something wrong with you, and people would look at you. So this can happen, right? And so Jesus is saying this is, this is very similar to the standing on the street corner thing. We're not just continuing on and on and on. And, and you get bonus points if you're praying in like King James English or something like that. I think you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, but the point is, Jesus is saying that, that doesn't impress God. 
right? Jesus says, don't pray like that. Filibustering God in your prayers, that does not impress him. And Jesus says, God already knows what you need anyway. You don't have to keep hitting the point over and over and over because God already knows. So you rambling on and on in your prayers, that's not going to help the situation. And again, I've not seen any of you guys doing that. I'm not thinking anybody in my mind when I'm saying this, but it does, it does happen. Right? And again, what Jesus is warning about here, this is a warning against hypocrisy, not lengthy prayers. And I know I've spoken to at least one of you guys about that. Jesus isn't saying, man, you got to keep a stopwatch out. And once you hit five minutes, you need to be done. Right? That's not what he's saying. Uh, in fact, I think as we become more mature in our faith, we realize there is more and more stuff that we really need to pray about. And so your prayers will naturally become longer and longer and more involved and more involved when we're praying correctly. And that's a good thing, right? The warning here is if you're just saying a bunch of flowery speech, it doesn't mean anything just to extend the time that you are praying to impress other people or as if that's going to somehow impress God, Jesus is saying, don't do that. I hope that's clear. So we've got these warnings. Here's what not to do. And then in verse 9, Jesus says, well, this is how you should pray. Here's verses 9 and 10. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, if we take this apart, there's an awful lot to the beginning of this prayer. He starts out, Father, right? This is who we are praying to. Next week, we're going to really dive into that. Uh, but it's interesting, too. He's not saying, not starting out with the address God. He calls him Father, right? So we, we have the address. We're, we're explaining who we are talking to. We're getting their attention. But we're also implying a relationship here. He's not just God. He's our Father. That's tremendous. And he's not just Father. Jesus says he is our Father, and so Jesus has said, yeah, you need to go off and you need to pray privately. But when you're doing that, recognize he's not just your God. He is our God. We are a community. We are in this thing together. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, we'll talk later. This could also even be suggesting our Father. We need to be bearing each other's burdens. We'll talk about this in subsequent weeks. Our Father who is in heaven. And so this is very clear. This is where God the Father is. It's a literal statement, and it's correct. Yes, that's where God the Father is right now. But by saying that, by beginning the prayer this way, our Father in heaven, he's bringing out a bigger point here. The prayer takes on some more significance this, with this part. He's speaking to God's sovereignty. God is not in Washington. God is in heaven. God is on a throne. God is Worthy of our worship because he is in heaven and on a throne. Because he is in heaven and on a throne, he is worthy of our submission. And so what Jesus is letting us know here is in our prayers, remember where God is and remember where you are. And that difference, God is in heaven on a throne. We are down here and most certainly not. That difference, recognizing that, that is the foundation of our entire relationship with him. God is in heaven. We are on earth. He is God. We are not. He is in charge. We are not. He is on a throne in heaven. We are not. And as such, we need to approach him in prayer with deep, deep humility. Beginning our prayers this way is recognizing that. It's setting the stage for Recognizing who he is and coming to him in this great humility that we need to do. Then he says, hallowed be your name. Hallowed. It means to greatly revered or, or greatly be respected. And so to hallow something is to make it holy. It's to sanctify it, right? And so this is what we're supposed to do with God's name in prayer. Now, Today we name children, and sometimes it's named after someone, but our names in this culture really don't mean very much. But that's not how things were back in Bible times. And we still say today sometimes, well, we, we need to have a good name in this town or something like that. But generally we don't think a lot about this. But 2,000 years ago in this culture, names were very important. God's names were very important. God, 
the names of God were very important. God's name is very important. We're going to dive into that more at the midweek uh, this week. So uh, definitely like to see you there. We're, we'll talk about that. Uh, but God's name is very important. It should be hallowed. It should be hallowed in our prayers. And notice here, Jesus starts the prayer this way. Right, this is how he begins the whole thing. Our Father in heaven, the conversation gets started. He's saying, getting God's attention. God, I'm talking to you. You are a Father. You are in heaven. And then the immediately, the first thing he says is, hallowed be your name. It's important that we follow this template because what, what that's doing by calling that out, hallowed be your name, that is shifting the focus of the prayer from us to him. And this is what our prayers need to be primarily about. It should be about God primarily and not us. Our prayers should be about his holiness. They should be about what he has done. They should be about who he is. And yes, there, there's a part of this for us too, and we're going to get to that. But the point is, we need to make him the priority in our prayers and I think too often it's easy for us to just kind of fall into the trap of making our prayers all about us and all about our requests. There's a place for that. But primarily, that's not the purpose of our prayers. And so we should be prioritizing properly, giving God the respect that he is due, being humble to him. Hallowed be your name. And then he said, your kingdom come. And again, this is not so much a specific location that it's talking about, although you can map it out that way. But this is really just pointing out or pointing to God's dominion and God's sovereignty. And so the Bible we know promises the coming of the millennial kingdom, and we should be looking forward to that. That's the 1,000 year reign of Christ where Jesus comes back to the earth at the second coming, and then literally he sits bodily on a throne in Jerusalem and rules the world from there, and he does this after he judges the nations and turns the corrupt and sinful world completely on its head. All right? That's the kingdom that Jesus is talking about here. He's saying in his prayers, bring along the millennial kingdom, please. Your kingdom come. And then he says, your will be done. And so this naturally follows the previous, right? Because when Jesus returns, prophecy is going to be fulfilled. And uh, that's the Lord's plan, right? It's prophecy. That's the Lord's will. That's been his plan all along. And so the prayer is just saying, God, I want what I want here and now, right? And as much uh, as I want that, I want Jesus to come back and I want your will to be done even more, right? Because we're saying this, we're crawling, crying out, Lord, let this prophecy be fulfilled before we're even talking about our own needs. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, he says. And what's in heaven right now, right? What is in heaven right now will literally be brought down to earth at the second coming, right? In the millennial kingdom, what is in heaven now will be in Jerusalem during the millennial kingdom. So when we're saying this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're really saying that we're looking forward to this dispensation that we're in now being over, right? We're saying we're pining for the time when Christ himself is going to sit on that throne in Jerusalem. And again, I think this is a great thing to prioritize early on in our prayers because I think it's a whole lot more important than a lot of the other stuff that we're going to be praying for. I want a whole lot of things. Right? I don't want a lot of stuff. I'm sure you want a lot of stuff. I want my candidate to win the election in November. I want to be able to adopt my youngest son. I want to be a better father. I want a supercharger for my old Corvette, and I want the clutch to start working again without me having to put any money or effort into the car. Right? But more than any of that, I look around at the world, and I see God mocked, and I see his people persecuted, and I see so many lost souls sprinting towards the fires of hell and bringing everyone along with them that they can. And I see the effects of the sin curse just corrupting and destroying everything. And I so much want all of that to stop. 
And not just so that my pain stops, but so that our God isn't mocked and blasphemed by it anymore. I long to see that prophecy fulfilled. I long to see that promise fulfilled of Jesus coming back because when he does, he's going to truly put an end to all this terrible wickedness of this place. And when he does, then God's name can truly be glorified on the lips of everyone who is left on earth. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What a prayer. Are you praying like this every day? Listen, when we pray these words, we're echoing the words of the very end of the Bible, Revelation 22, verses 20 through 21. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. When we cry these things out, we're not going to speed up God's timeline at all. But what we're doing is we're crying out our heart's position, Lord. I want what you want more than what I want. I am looking forward to this promise being fulfilled because finally things will be better here. They will be the way that they should be. Verse 11, give us today our daily bread. Now, now we're going to make a petition to God. Now we're asking God to give us something for us. And listen, it's okay to ask God for stuff. We're supposed to. We're going to talk more about this in subsequent weeks. But notice the order. We're asking God to give us something, but we're not doing that until after we have claimed that he is on the throne in heaven. Well, we are down here. We have humbled ourselves out. We have hallowed his name. We have cried out that whatever it is that we want for ourselves, what we want more is what he wants. We want on earth what is in heaven. And after that is done, now, now we can dare to ask God for something for ourselves. Notice what we're asking for here, too. Give us our daily bread. Asking for bread. That is a humble request here. We're not going before God and asking for a Wagyu steak. Right? We're not asking for the world here in our prayer, but we're asking for our basic needs to be met. And notice the reach here, right? Next week or the week after, we're going to talk about praying big, and I want to challenge all of us to pray for really big things and actually, I think we've already done a little bit of that in the prayer earlier. Right? God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's a huge prayer. God's plans are huge. So it's a big, big prayer to ask for those things to be done. But I think we have a whole lot of other opportunities to pray big here. And we often leave those things on the table. And again, we'll, we'll cover this later. Uh, but we've prayed for God's will to be done. And now we get for the part we're asking God to give us something just for us. Uh, and and what, what is the request? It's, Lord, please just give me my bread for today. And the point here is my life, all of this, all of this, it's not about me. It's about you. Here I am praying to the creator and sustainer of the very universe who has promised to answer all of our prayers and we only have so much time on this earth and, and we can spend that talking to him and it's amazing that he'll, he'll listen to us. And so we've got this arrangement in place and a limited time to use it. And so what are you going to bother the creator of the entire universe for? A King Ranch F-150? It would be nice, right? But we shouldn't be worried about that. We should pray for God's name to be glorified in the world. We should want that tremendously more than we want that king ranch or, or whatever it is that you want. And then once that's done, the promise of the Bible is, or a promise of the Bible is, God's not going to forget you. Jesus has already said before he began this prayer, he already knows what you need. And if you think about it, you give bread to a prisoner, and Paul shows that we are all prisoners in Christ, and, and that's true, but the Bible also says that we're God's children, and children are always, when it's possible, given a whole lot more than just bread. And I think for all of us, we can look around and be very thankful for God blessing us tremendously because every single person in this room is right now receiving much, much more than just bread from God. And in addition to bread, yeah, maybe God will give you a nice pickup. But when we fall on our knees before God himself, we need to be humble. Lord, please just let me eat today so I can serve you. 
And then let him choose to reward you in abundance beyond that if he wishes to do so. And notice, too, what he's talking about here, our daily bread he asks for. And so since it's daily bread, what's being recognized with that? We're not just asking for, to be sustained and, and nothing more for ourselves than that. It's recognizing kind of this continual dependence on God. Lord, please give me my bread today. Right, if God gives me this bread today, this presupposes that tomorrow I'm going to have to get on my knees and I'm going to ask for it again. And the day after that, I'm going to do the same. And the day after that, and the day after that, and so on and so forth until my dying day. We've got this continual dependence on the Lord. We need to continue to pray to him. Verse 12 Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. So we're supposed to pray for our spiritual needs in addition to our physical needs. And the word here is translated into English as debts. Very, this Greek word is very seldom used in the Bible. I think it only appears in two places. If you include the Greek version of the Old Testament, I think it shows up in four, but regardless uh, the Catholics translate this as trespasses. You can translate this word into a lot of different ways, but technically it's talking about our sins here and the resulting debt owed to God for us being forgiven from them. But you can translate this as shortcomings, forgive us for our resentments, forgive us for anything we have done wrong, forgive us uh, even for what we owe God. And this one, I think, sometimes trips people up a little bit. And depending on your denominational background or how you came up, I know I've been asked questions about this before. The Bible is absolutely clear at the moment that you make Jesus your savior, right? The moment that you get born again, all of your sins, past, present, and future, they're forgiven, right? Your salvation was accomplished by Jesus's work on the cross and it becomes effective in you when you put your faith in him. John chapter six, verse 47, Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life, All right? So the Bible is clear, repeated confession does not save you. It is belief in Christ that saves us. And so this is where people sometimes get a little bit off track and I understand the logic here. They'll say, well, if I have been forgiven, then why do I have to continue asking for forgiveness? And the answer to that I think is pretty simple um, because you know, well, the answer is you don't need to keep asking for forgiveness to maintain your salvation, but we do need to keep asking for forgiveness because despite the fact that Jesus paid that price for us and we asked him to be our savior, we continue to sin even after we have been saved. All right, and if that doesn't warrant an apology to God, I don't know what does. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And so this part here presupposes that we've forgiven other people before we have even started out this prayer. And so I think this kind of calls back to Matthew chapter 18, which we talked about again last week. That's the parable of the unmerciful servant. And we've got this man who owed his master a tremendous amount of money, an amount he could never repay. He gets forgiven for this debt. He runs into one of his servants who owed him a much smaller amount comparatively, and he wouldn't forgive that man his debt, and he treated him cruelly. And so the master corrected him very, very strongly for that. And the whole purpose with that is to teach us that if you become a Christian, God has forgiven you for all of your trespasses, all of your debts, all of your sins, past, present, and future. And however much somebody ever sins against you, that's going to be tiny in comparison to what God has forgiven you for. So if we have been forgiven by God, we have no right to withhold that forgiveness from others. And so this prayer here is just operationally showing, hey, before we even come before God and ask to have our sins forgiven in our hearts, man, we got to take care of this too. And if you're struggling with that, you can pray to God to help you deal with that. It's not saying you can't pray, but this is the position that our hearts should be in in uh, a good and effective prayer situation. Verse 13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And so here, this one also gets a little confusing. Sounds like uh, sometimes it could sound like that this is asking God not to tempt us. And we know that's not possible, right? James chapter one, verses 13 to 14 says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. 
but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. All right, so what this part of the prayer is, is this is us asking God to direct our paths away from things that might ensnare us. And so similarly, this last part, and deliver us from the evil one, is not, uh, it's not asking to ultimately be delivered from the clutches of Satan, because if you're born again, that victory is already assured, right? And so this is just simply a prayer here, asking God to help us avoid sin, to help us avoid these temptations in our lives that might be too big for us to deal with. And that, my friends, is the Lord's Prayer. This prayer here given to us by Jesus, very powerful tool, very misunderstood in Western culture. This is not a, a magic incantation to be repeated again and again, right? If you just repeat this prayer mindlessly over and over, I don't think it's going to do anything for you other than take up your time. But if you look at what Jesus is telling us here, in this prayer, Jesus provides us with most of the necessary components of effective daily prayer. So I'm saying most here, I mean, this is a pretty good prayer template. And so you can just pray this prayer. You can read these words <coughs> as long as you're not just mindlessly repeating them. You can, from your heart, just read this and pray this to God. It's a wonderful template. Or even better, you can take your time and work through this, read verse by verse, pray the verse, and then in your own words, expand on that. Talk about how this fits your situation. Cry out to God. It is a wonderful template for doing that. But we have to recognize this prayer template that Jesus gives us, as good as it is, it's incomplete. Because there's other biblical requirements for prayer here that Jesus doesn't list out. But it's a really good start. And as we kicked off this whole series I said we would walk before we would run, and I think we've built a great foundation for prayer here today. We've walked. All right, but next week we're going to go quite a bit deeper. We're going to talk about a gap in this prayer that we need to fill, and we're going to challenge ourselves on at least a few of these different components here that I think probably most of us think we're all getting right, but I'd suggest that a lot of us could probably improve in some of these areas. And a couple of those things are going to be pretty small things that at the end of the day aren't hugely, hugely important. But there is going to be one that is a very, very big thing that if you will take this Bible lesson to heart, it can change your prayer life forever and transform your relationship with the Lord. So look forward to seeing you guys at the midweek. And I look forward to seeing you next Sunday as well when we continue this series. Would you bow with me in prayer? Dear Heavenly God, we thank you so, so, so very much for giving us your word. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to gather together and worship you as a church family today. Thank you for our missionaries who are able to be with us today and us being able to hear what's going on with their ministry. And we ask that you would just bless them in abundance and help them to reach these uh, people out there uh, that, that others um, don't have access to, Lord. We pray that that would be very effective. Lord, we thank you for this study on prayer, and I just pray that you would help us to examine these things and really uh, look at our lives and our prayer lives and, and see, are we, are we doing the best that we could do? Are there ways that we could improve? And Father, if I've made any mistakes in what I have said, I pray you would bring those things to light so no one would be led astray. But God, anything that we have said that's true and in accordance with your word, God, give us wisdom from these things. Help us to become better sons and daughters to you as a result. Please get us home safely, Lord, and bring us back together soon so we can worship you again as a family. We love you and pray this in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Tim. Um, if everyone could stand with us, we're going to sing hymn 389, Make Me a Blessing. <laughs> 